Tonight's top European Union stories from the Unit UK include EU contributes 57 million euros to improve Egypt's water systems. Francis Le Pen in Moscow blames EU for a new Cold War. And European Union to approve bank rules before May election slows legislative machine. So, is HS2 driven by the EU? Plus, UK's relationship with the European Union enters a fragile state. It's Thursday, May 1st. I'm Rick Timmis, and this is the Unit Nightly News. First up, the hot story from our website, theunituk.com. EU contributes 57 million euros to improve Egypt's water systems. The European Union announced that it will implement a number of water sector projects in Egypt that will benefit the Ministry of Housing and the Holding Company for Water and Wastewater during a workshop Wednesday at the EU delegation to Egypt offices. The first project, titled the Improved Water and Wastewater Services Programme, is comprised of two phases that aim to improve and expand existing water and wastewater treatment plants. The EU contributed €57 million Euros to the project, which is estimated to cost €598 million. Euros. The EU plans to implement other projects to improve the capacity of holding companies for water and wastewater, which aims to develop sustainable high water and wastewater services to support the country's economic and environmental development. Interesting that whilst we are reporting on the one hand that the EU has debt and liquidity problems, with dramatic austerity burdens placed upon member states, and the ECB talking about money printing, or although they prefer to call it uh, quantitative easing, on the other hand is splashing cash around the globe like a crazed lottery winner. And what I find most interesting is that almost all of this aid spending targets countries with destabilised governments, the tinfoil hat folks would say that this looks like a political dynamic at work. Francis Le Pen in Moscow blames the EU for a new Cold War. Marine Le Pen, leader of France's far-right National Front, blamed the European Union for declaring a new Cold War on Russia that would hurt all concerned. Russian media reported on Saturday as they paid an official visit to Moscow. Europe-Russia relations are at their lowest ebb in decades after President Vladimir Putin's annexation of Crimea prompted the EU to impose sanctions on dozens of prominent Russian officials and lawmakers. However, Le Pen, along with other Eurosceptic leaders of the far left and nationalist right, believe the original fault lies with Brussels for offering closer ties with the Ukraine a move that Russia opposes. Well, as in story one, whilst the chips were down in the Ukraine, economically speaking, the EU was beckoning from the wings, come and join, come and join, with an ECB and an IMF gravy boat in each hand. Now, whilst we in Britain class chips and gravy as a national treasure, Russia, it seems, is not so keen. EU to approve bank rules before May election slows legislative machine. The European Union will sign off on a slew of major reforms this week to allow failing banks to be wound down without public money, clearing its desk before elections in May that may lead to a slower pace of legislation. This week is the final plenary session of the European Parliament before it breaks up ahead of the vote in May. The welter of rules the bloc has approved since the worst financial crisis in a generation began unfolding from a corner of the US housing market in 2007 is fundamentally reshaping the banking and securities industry. Now, the rule changes also strengthen the bloc's grip on capital markets at the expense of national governments, to an extent few federalists would have dared to dream of as policymakers want to avoid more taxpayer bailouts of banks and Eurozone countries. From November, the European Central Bank will directly supervise top lenders in the single currency area, adding to three new EU regulators for banks, insurers and markets launched in 2011 with binding powers over member states. 
It will also rubber stamp a sweeping reform of security markets that will draw commodities under the regulatory net for the first time and crack down on high-frequency trading, a type of ultra-fast computerized trading that the FBI is probing. Now, even if few new laws are proposed, those passed since the crisis are already stuffed with clauses requiring regular reviews, offering lawmakers an easy way to toughen them up. What's alarming is that a whole body of existing rules will come up for review twice in the next Parliament. Now, our commentary on this is that this liability protection for the public purse also dovetails with legislative changes last year that reclassified savings depositors as creditors. Now, this offers the banks the ability to treat investors saving as a credit liability on its books, which means that in the event of the bank failing, savers would not have recourse against the bank as corporate liability law protects the banks and its shareholders. Now, this represents a significant risk for savers. Of course, member state government protection still holds to protect savers, but we will keep a close eye on this topic. So, is HS2 driven by the EU? This is the second of a series of blogs that we will publish on the link between HS2 and the EU's transport policy, TEN-T. The previous blog on this set out some of the basic elements of the 10T policy and can be found here. Now, in this blog, I want to say something about the overall thrust of 10T policy and the extent to which it has or has not driven HS2. The most important thing to grasp is that the 10T proposals are not just a set of nice ideas for routes across Europe with a handy pot of money attached, once this was what they were, but no longer. Now, 10T policy is both more politicised and it is no longer quite so voluntary. Unfortunately for 10T policy over the years, member states have not gone on done what they were supposed to do in terms of building the transport networks that they all agreed would be a good idea. So a key feature of the 2013 revision of the 10 policy is that the EC will play a more dominant role in getting the actual infrastructure built and running. So a key feature of the 2013 revision of the 10 policy is that the European Commission will play a more dominant role in getting the actual infrastructure built and running. This is through what they refer to as the new governance instrument of 10 policy. This article digs deeper into this European-wide transport policy and is a prime example of the EU direct effect mechanism at work. This mechanism provides the vehicle that overrides member state national parliaments and laws, driving European policy from the top down, whilst disguising it as national decision-making. UK's relationship with the EU enters a fragile stage. Imagine for a second a report written by an official from the Department of Foreign Affairs that detailed how Ireland might exit the euro and reconstitute the punt, describing all the new institutional arrangements that would follow such a policy decision. The report might say that the author was not advocating this policy and was written in a purely personal capacity and therefore should not be described as reflecting the views of either the department or the government. Imagine the strong conclusions are that a transition to the punt could be managed and would be successful. Or well, notwithstanding the disclaimers, we might smell a rat, or perhaps we could take it all at face value. Either way, we would sit up and take notice. At the very least, we would wonder why the authorities would permit publication. It would be quite a provocative act. A relatively junior official in the UK Foreign Office has just won a €100,000 prize for describing how the UK might successfully exit the EU. It is perhaps ironic the prize is denominated in euros. Today we have a recording of our live interactive table talk show that we hosted today at noon. Now the panel looked at the European elections which are to be held on May the 22nd. This included looking at candidates' profiles for the new president of the European Commission. Oh, those are the ones that you can't vote on, by the way. And we looked at the structure of the European parliamentary system, hoping to unravel how it works. I mean, it's always helpful to actually know what it is you're voting for. 
And we also asked the question, how do the mainstream national parties' campaigns relate to Europe? It was an excellent show, and for those of people that took the time to join us today, we are very thankful. And we certainly would appreciate your comments and input on show content and future issues. So please do feel free to email us via the website. And on that note, remember to visit our website, theunituk.com, for all the very latest news. You can find our page on Facebook by searching for The Unit UK, all one word. Join our community on Google+, Plus, where you can interact with us, voice your opinions and post comments about our stories and even get involved in the shows. And for all the latest tweets as they happen, then follow us on Twitter, at The E Unit. And of course... Please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for the unit, Nightly News. I'll see you soon. <laughs>